Wash away all my iniquity And cleanse me from all my sin All right, Munster Week 8, the final chapter. I uh, hope this look back into church history has been helpful for you and for me. I hope it's equipped us. I hope it's equipped us to have a better understanding of events around the Reformation. And most importantly, the, the dangers of abandoning Sola Scriptura, abandoning proper hermeneutics, abandoning proper roles of laymen in the church, of elders in the church, and the church in general. And I also hope that when we encounter those that falsely identify as as using Sola Scriptura, as those in Munster would would readily affirm that they were doing, that they, well, yeah, we're using Sola Scriptura. Yeah, we're, this is the proper church. Yeah, this is the actual, this is actual Christianity. That we can engage those, those individuals with a proper doctrine and understanding of those terms. A good example is if we, when we speak to our Mormon friends, they may use similar similar terminology, similar doctrines, but they're going to have totally different meanings than an orthodox understanding. And it's important if we're going to engage those of other faiths that promulgate a false faith that we understand and can argue and explain the orthodox definitions of these doctrines. So over the eight weeks, I hope that's helped you somehow. But uh, let's get right into, into the events. All right, so we left off last week. Hundreds leaving Munster, looking to find refuge under the Prince Bishop. They've had it with the starving uh, atmosphere in Munster, and they, they, they need to find better pastures, right? Greener pastures. Is it green? The grass is greener on the Prince Bishop's side, or so they hope. But that's not going to be the case. Prince Bishop's going to have no sympathy for these re- refugees. Not only that, but Waldock knows that the more that the more who stay in Munster, the more mouths Leiden has to feed, the quicker that they're going to starve and the city's going to fall. And not only that, but Prince, you know, Waldock has some legit disdain for those in Munster. He doesn't want anything good to happen from the rebels inside the walls, including them thinking they can just give up and find refuge with with him. <clears throat> So in his disdain and in his, in his desperation and in his anger and rage, he gives an order that any fleeing refugee coming out of Munster, every man that's part of a family or, or, or just really any man that's, that's running from the city uh, should be killed. And if they do have families, if they have women and children, they are to stay in between the walls of Munster and the Prince Bishop's army. And you wonder what the purpose of that was. Well, Prince Bishop Waldeck wants them to go back inside Munster because, again, for the reasons I just stated, and if they, he keeps them there around Munster, he'll think, he thinks that Janet Lydon will bring them back in. But Lydon's already said if you leave, there is no coming back, and those, those doors are barred. There's no coming back. So Waldeck gives this, this order that you would think actually – should have come from Jan of Light himself. This is a, a pretty brutal, grotesque order to give. And his top general, Waldeck's top general, refuses to, to enact this decree. And he, uh, on the, he, he protests in good conscience he cannot do this. But Waldeck doesn't listen to his general. Uh, instead, he, he executes a lot of the Anabaptist prisoners that he currently has and then uh, brings their body parts around Munster to send a message to those inside. And the lower echelon of the army actually do enact this decree. So even though the Waldeck's top general has protested, the lower echelon are actually going to do this. So the Prince Bishop's army starts killing these, these fleeing men. And it's roughly 40 to 50 men like a day because these these refugees aren't coming out all at once. They kind of, they trickle out, right? So they're trickling out and it ends up being around like 40, 50 men a day that the Prince Bishop's army is killing. And then the families of those men uh, are stuck and they're still starving. 
and they knew this was a possibility, but, but now they, now they know it's a possibility that, okay, they're going to, they're going to die at the hands of the Prince Bishop, but I guess it's better to die outside the walls than in the walls. But, um, this goes on for about four weeks, this trickling out of refugees and this, these killing these killings from the Prince Bishop's army. And after the four weeks is over around 600 men are going to be killed. 600 men. And what happens is like they, people like Philip of Hess, you know, the, these top, these upper echelon generals who don't want this order to go out. They're trying to get advice from like Philip of Hess, who's a Lutheran and, and some other theologians trying to, trying to, uh, stop the Prince Bishop from, from enacting this decree. And eventually the Prince Bishop gives in, right? So that eventually, and we'll get there, but eventually the Prince Bishop decides, uh, to actually take in the refugees, but we'll get there. All right. We also talked about Henry Grays and his, his, uh, defection to the Prince Bishop's army, to Waldeck's army. And his defection has, has emboldened others who in their starving state are questioning, of course, the Anabaptist movement right now. And the most consequential of these, I mentioned his name, is Henry Gresbeck. And Gresbeck is important for two reasons. One, he is going to be the man that hands over the city. And two, he's actually going to be one of the men that writes a eyewitness account of the events that happen in Munster. Him and uh, Kessenbrook, Uh, are going to be the two men who write accounts of what happened. Most of the material used for the study comes from those men's writing. So that's, uh, those are the two reasons Gresbeck is important. Um, But up up to this point, like many others that I've mentioned in the story, he grew up in Munster, Gresbeck grew up in Munster, and he seemed to be, much like Henry Gray, an enthusiastic follower of the Anabaptist movement once it reached Munster. And then again, there's some point where he rejects the Anabaptist agenda and, and schemes his departure uh, from, from the town. I mean, starvation has, is a big deal, but I think he, uh, he also, uh, he was friends with, with Mullenheck, right? And uh, the men that had been executed and who have retaliated against the, the leaders in, of the Anabaptist movement. So there's probably a lot of reasons why he, he, decides to abandon their principles. Uh, Gresbeck's a former soldier and he's a, he's, he was assigned guard duty. So he's, he, every night he's out there, uh, patrolling the walls, making sure there's no, uh, attacks from the Prince Bishop and monitoring their movements. And obviously because of that, he knows many of the other guards and slowly he discovers others who share his, desire to leave the city. And most notably, there's a captain uh, of the guard whose nickname uh, was Little Hands in the Corner. <laughs> How would you like that for a call sign? Little Hans in the Corner. It makes me think of Die Hard. Uh, anyway, uh, so so Grisbeck and Little Hans in the Corner conspire to, to leave the city and, and they're going to seek refuge with the Prince Bishop. Th- their mindset is, is very similar to any of the other refugees leaving. They know they're going to die in Munster. They're all starving to death. And it's just a matter of time before the Prince Bishop does get in or something happens. Uh, so, so that's a certainty in their mind, but it's not a certainty that the Prince Bishop will kill them. It's a likelihood. It's probably a high probability. They, they know what's happening to refugees at this point. They can see what, what the Prince Bishop is doing, but there's still a chance compared to staying in Munster. Now, they did have concerns of, the, of Prince Bishop just killing them as they try to escape, but they did have one hope that because they're guards, Grisbeck and Little Hans in the corner, because they're guards, they have keys to most of the gates around Munster, and they know which ones are not watched carefully. So they actually have vital information that will help the Prince Bishop in ending this, this siege that's been going on for over a year. The, uh, what, uh, what Gresbeck also had in his corner was his youth. He's a young guy and, you know, people, soldiers aren't, aren't going to be as apt to kill uh, the younger generation, right? They're going to have more, 
We have more sympathy for young people. Maybe they just got caught up in this or, you know, all their whole life, their whole lives are ahead of them. Right. That's, he's hoping that that will assist him in, in surviving this escape. And at midnight on the 23rd of May, Gresbeck and little Hans in the corner make their escape. And they leave out of the Holy Cross gate and they lower themselves into the moat. They swim across undetected. And because it was nighttime and, you know, there's, there's confusion. Their adrenaline's up. It's a very tense moment. They actually get split up. So they're split up shortly after they escape. But both of them try to make their way to the Prince Bishop's line. Very, very shortly after, Gresbeck is cited by Prince Bishop's guards. He's ordered to surrender. And it seems like his youth, Gresbeck's youth, has actually saved his life. The soldiers don't immediately kill him. He th- he's, waiting, he's waiting for the spear thrust into his back or in his, wherever. He's waiting, he's waiting for that sharp pain to end his life. But it doesn't come. And they ask him what he's doing. He, he tells them he's running. He's a refugee from Munster. He has information that he would like to share to the captain. And the soldiers are kind of deliberating. Like, should we kill this guy or not? And they decide not to. And they, they lend out or they lend out their spear uh, staff. And he grabs it. And, and they lift him out of this marshy area. And... Gresbeck still thinks he's he's probably going to die. He still thinks that maybe they're just toying with him. Many others like him in the same scenario were just run through. So he still thinks his chances for living are very low. But Gresbeck is brought up in front of these men. He pleads with them. Hey, I, I, again, I got this information. It's very important. You, you got to let me see the captain, your captain, and let me explain what's going on. For whatever reason, the the guards agree. Okay, well, you know, let's let's take him. And Gresbeck, after he's taken to the captain, learns how close he actually was to being killed. The soldiers were actually debating to should they just kill him or should they help him. And it was his youth ultimately that did save him. They didn't want to kill a, a young man, so that's that's really what saved his life. <clears throat> So he goes in front of the captain and he explains that he escaped from the gate called the Holy Cross gate. And actually that gate is not well defended. It's not looked at and he can get the Prince Bishop, Prince Bishop's men inside the Holy Cross gate undetected. Now, how many times have we heard stories or information that's going to end the siege, but it really never comes to fruition. It's been a few times, right? Uh, but this time is going to be different. The captain listens to what, Gres- what Gresbeck has to say, and he's intrigued, obviously. I mean, how many times, how many plans have been foiled by the Prince Bishop? They, I mentioned last week the pressure from the leaders of the Holy Roman Empire on top of the Prince Bishop to end this. Munster is a thorn in the side of everybody, and it, at this point, Munster really could bring down the Holy Roman Empire. This, this town of rebels has been a focal point for everyone in the empire. If, the, if those in Munster are able to escape somehow, it's going to and, and embolden other Anabaptist uh, groups around, and it potentially could bring down the Holy Roman Empire. So the captain is willing to give Gresbeck a chance, but he wants to see with his own eyes. The captain wants to see with his own eyes, Gresbeck get inside uh, the Holy cross gate or swim the moat, get inside the Holy cross gate and then come back to the captain. And Gresbeck agrees to do this. He's like, sure, I can do that. And they wait till the cover of night of cover of darkness. They, they walk out to where Gresbeck escaped initially Gresbeck successfully traverses the moat. He gets in, he sneaks in through the Holy Cross gate like he did before, and he successfully returns undetected. The group is the captain, the group that are with him are amazed. 
they even say to themselves, if we had enough men right now, we could take the city right now. So they go back to their camp and Gresbeck, who before was just this refugee, another refugee that could have been killed at any moment, has now overnight become the most important man within the Prince Bishop's army. Even though that they have this door, this Holy Cross gate that seems like a free pass in a, in a monster. Once they get back to the camp, it's, there's going to be a delay of the attack for a month. The attack plans are going to be drafted. They're going to be ready to go. But the revelation of a terrible and terrifying new weapon that the Anabaptists have constructed is revealed by Henry Grays. And that's what we're going to look at next. For I know my transgression And my sin is always before me Well, what is this terrifying weapon that Grays knows about? And how does Grays know about it at all? Well, before, before Grays defects to the Prince Bishop, almost a, a year before Grays defects, he comes up with this, this idea uh, and pitches it to Jan of Leiden. And what he comes up with is what, I'll, what I'm going to describe as the very first tank. And some of you might be saying, did he say tank? Like, like a modern, modern warfare tank or a tank in like World War I? Well, obviously it's not as sophisticated as that, but it, it essentially will be the first tank. Grace comes, comes up with this idea as the Anabaptists are waiting for uh, this reinforcing army uh, that's going to flank the Prince Bishop. And as that's happening, Grays is going to ride out with these tanks and break through the Prince Bishop's line. And then those inside Munster can get out. That's, that's the plan, right? Uh, of course, that falls apart. That army is intercepted. It is, it is wiped out. And then Grays defects, right? And then the second army that was supposed to come, Grays tells the Prince Bishop about, right? So that army is gone. Not to mention that this design, this wagon tank that Grays has designed must be uh, pulled by six horses. And by this point, all the horses are eaten. So there's no, there's no way to use these tanks, but here's, here's kind of the design that Grays, uh, Henry Grays came up with. So these are up armored wagons, right? And the wheels on these wagons are lined with iron, which gives them uh, the much stronger uh, they're able to traverse more difficult terrain than normal and each each wagon has a, a cannon mounted to the front so it has one cannon mount on the front and then it has up to it can have up to eight arbicus muskets that are that are joined horizontally and they are jerry-rigged to fire all at once so the cannon and then eight arbicus muskets will fire all at once and you can have up to six crew members and this wagon tank. <clears throat> and those six crew members could fire their weapons out from the armor, from inside, giving it almost a 360-degree kill radius. Now, you can imagine, and they eventually built 16 of these wagon tanks. Now, you can imagine 16 of, of weapons of war that no one has ever seen before like this riding out from Munster into the Prince Bishop while they're getting attacked by somebody else would cause chaos. They would have absolutely broken through the Prince Bishop's army. It was an ingenious and deadly idea, but it never comes to fruition because of the, the reasons I stated earlier. But they have been, uh, they are planted around Munster as defensive positions. And they're still able to fire. They're still deadly. And like I said, there's 16 of them. So if... If those inside Munster could gather around those, these wagon tanks, these immobile wagon tanks, but essentially hard defensive points, they could out, they could fight off Prince Bishop's army for a while. So that was the reason for the delay of the attack initially for that first month. But after that month, after that delay, the Prince Bishop's officers decide that the attack's going to take place on June 22nd, 1535. Now, most, eh, I'll say, yeah, I'll say all of the lessons that the Prince Bishop's army has learned since the siege has started 
will be remembered. The one most importantly remembered is the very first assault of the drunk soldiers charging the wall. And because of this, uh, days before the attack, days before this was uh, June 22nd, they, the officers banished any sale or any consumption of alcohol. And if any soldier was caught with, with contraband, it was immediate death. So they're learning. They're learning. Now, as the main army is preparing for the assault on, on Munster, their movements, they're, they're preparing at night. They're trying to conceal their movements, right? And their movements are actually, even though it's at night, their movements are concealed by heavy thunderstorms. It's, uh, it's in the middle of thund- uh, thunderstorm season in, uh, in Western Germany. And they're able to conceal their movements from the guards in Munster, the rain was so heavy that those on the wall in Munster sought shelter down beneath, uh, uh, below the walls. So as the, the guards of Munster are just minding their own business, trying to stay out of the rain, 500 soldier volunteers from the Prince Bishop army have cho- have been chosen as an advanced force, uh, that are going to sneak inside the Holy cross gate. And this, this uh, advanced force is going to have two main objectives. Their first one is going to be to capture the Holy Cross gate and secure the, secure the gate to allow the larger attacking army to come in. And then the second objective is they're going to secure the city arsenal. The idea was if they can secure all the munitions that the, that the Anabaptists have in Munster, it's going to, it's going to drive them to panic. They can't defend and then it'll, the city will crumble. And a makeshift bridge designed by actually Gresbeck uh, and actually helped put in place by Gresbeck. A makeshift bridge is constructed across the outer moat. And on the 22nd, the night of the 22nd, June 22nd, soldiers stream over this makeshift makeshift bridge, the 500 advanced soldiers, and uh, they hoist ladders to get over that outer wall. The Anabaptist guards, who are still trying to stay out of the rain, are completely caught by surprise and quickly dispatched. They're killed. The Prince Bishop soldiers continue across the inner moat, across it's like this thin stone stone bridge they get across, and they catch another guard. Uh, one, he's just a lonely guard by himself. Catches him by surprise. Uh, they don't kill him right away. They actually uh, th- this guard panics. He surrenders, and he actually reveals the password of the day. Between, uh, between the guards of Munster, which was Earth. So now they had the password in, in case they were, they were uh, interrogated. And, you know, that's how they interrogate each other, make sure they knew they were Anabaptists and not an s- army sneaking in, right? So, so far, the stealth mission is going perfectly to plan. All that's left, they have the Holy Cross Gate. All that's left is uh, for them to go capture the, the uh, munitions, the armory, and then the main force can move in. They'll capture the armory, leave some, leave some guys there, and then go back to the Ho- Holy Cross Gate, and then uh, the main force will attack. Well, they, they capture the armory without incident. They kill the guards there and, and secure it. But shortly after capturing the armory, trumpets sound. The alarm, go, the, the alarm is tripped, and armed Anabaptists launch an attack against the intruding force at the armory. And at this point, the, the attacking Anabaptists outnumber the, the advanced force of the 500 men. And not only that, so you have armed Anabaptists attacking uh, the armory, but they are actually uh, have supporting fire from cannons on top of St. Margaret's uh, Chapel. So Saint, those cannons are firing on the Prince Bishop men while these Anabaptists are assaulting as well. The Prince Bishop's men decide instead of making a stand at the armory. They're going to retreat through the streets of Munster and try to find a a better defensible position. And uh, so as they're doing that, as those, as Waldeck's men are trying to find a better position outside of Munster, the, the leaders or the the officers of the the large army that's going to attack, he starts hearing, uh, starts hearing what's going on inside Munster. So they hear, they hear that the fighting has started and you would think that they would attack immediately. Um, but <laughs> once again, they hesitate. The, the officers of the large army aren't sure what's going on. They're not sure if it's a trap, right? 
the 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 failures of the prince bishop before are coming back to haunt them they think well what if this is a, just another humiliating attack unfolding so instead of helping their their advanced force in munster they wait and there's some serious skirmishing going on inside munster between the anabaptists and waldeck's men finally though the anabaptists retreat because the uh, Waldex men inside Munster figure out how to flank the Anabaptists that are attacking them. So once they do that, once Waldex men flank the Anabaptists, the Anabaptists think, oh no, uh, Waldex reinforced the men inside Munster. So they flee. So the Anabaptists flee thinking that Waldex men is being reinforced. And the advanced force just narrowly averts complete, utter disaster. So as the Anabaptists are retreating, of course, the advance, the leaders, or the officers of the advance force are, run, are wondering how the Anabaptists were alerted to their presence. If, if the Holy Cross gate was secure, they should not never have uh, been able to sound the alarm. But of course, in the confusion of war, the strike force or the strike team failed to leave a, a guard at the Holy Cross gate. So they just, everyone left going to secure the armory. And... Anabaptist guards doing their guard duty just walked up and, and found these these uh, dead guards. And, of course, they sounded the alarm. And so it wasn't treachery, right? It was just, it was just the confusion of war that uh, announced the Anabaptists to their presence. So now it's, it's well into the morning, into the early morning. We're talking 1, 2 a.m. And the hunkered down... Uh, Waldex troops are preparing for another assault from from the Anabaptists, but instead of another assault, they actually they hear the voice of Jan of Leiden. So Jan of Leiden shows up and he yells to Waldex men that he wants to negotiate. And this is exactly what Waldex men need, right? They need to buy some time. They need to buy some time, and somehow communicate to the army outside the walls that they need to attack right now. <laughs> So the officers of Waldeck of, of that strike force decide, yeah, we'll negotiate by some time, right? So the, the Waldeck's men agree to a ceasefire, and uh, they're going to negotiate with, with Leiden or whatever. So the, the fake negotiations last until the, the early morning. When finally, in the early morning, finally the leaders of the main army decide to attack. Whatever whatever convinces them to, to finally unleash their, their main force uh, is in the nick of time because the negotiations weren't going to last that much longer. And as the sun is rising, both the trapped, both the trapped Waldex men and the Anabaptists look up to see a wave of soldiers storming over the outer walls, yelling to Waldeck, to Waldeck. Right? They're yelling, you know, essentially for the Prince Bishop, and at that point, Munster had been taken. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. What follows is nothing less than a bloodbath. Many Anabaptists, after Waldeck soldiers are streaming over the wall, try to retreat to those 16 tanks that have, are in the, in those defensive positions that they've uh, that they've made with those uh, immobile tanks, and they actually have enough munitions to really uh, make a defense for like a, a day or two, but they don't. They end up surrendering. Um, they they run to them, but they decide it's not worth it. But many of them are are still killed, even though they surrender. And I just want to go over the, some of the main characters or the characters that we've brought up during this during the study and, and just. Uh, describe their uh, most of their fates uh, for this point on it gets you know it gets a little graphic so if you have you know kids watching this just uh, keep that in mind uh, Brusenmeister I don't know if you remember him his nickname was Cyclops uh, he's killed and his body's thrown to the river Herman Tilbeck he's uh, he's the one who burned the Prince Bishop's letter uh, back early on in uh, 1534 ultimately it's you could argue it's because he burned that letter from the Prince Bishop that 
monster fell into the chaos that it did. But he's also the one that led the counterattack against Molenhek in his rebellion. Tilbeck was found hiding like a coward and stabbed to death, and his body falls into the dung and decaying flesh uh, that is Munster. Kevin Brooke, the former co-mayor with uh, Nipperdong, you may remember him, was killed in, in the Cathedral Square. Of, of all the men that the Prince Bishop sought, next to Jan of Leiden, Bernard Rothman was the one he wanted the most. Unfortunately, Rothman was never found. There were stories that some saw Rothman in a, like a white gown fighting, and he, eventually he stabbed in the side or somewhere, but his body is never recovered. The Prince Bishop, at the end of this, actually orders his men to go through every single dead body as they're burying them in this mass grave and identi- try to identify Bernard Rothman, but they do not. They never find his body. And from this, this point on, there'll be stories of, of sightings of Bernard Rothman, that he's, he's in this part of Germany, he's being housed by this prince under his protection, but nobody really knows what happens to him. And the Prince Bishop's never going to get the satisfaction of knowing if Rothman died a, or a painful death. Jan of Leiden and Nipperdaling are eventually captured. The wives of the leaders uh, were given options to recant from their Anabaptism or die. Most chose to die, including uh, Devara, Devira, Mathis's widow, who Jan of Leiden marries. She, uh, she won't recant, and she, she chooses to die. After the soldiers unleash their rage upon the city, the prince bishop arrives in all his splendor, to see for himself this uh, king of Munster. And Gresbeck writes this, writes of this encounter in his, in his firsthand account. The encounter between these two kings. Uh, and it's also mentioned in the book, the Taylor King as well. And the Prince Bishop uh, looks Jan of Leiden up and down, looks him, looks him over. And he asks in German, Bist du ein König? Are you a king? And do is the informal use of you, used when speaking to inferiors. So it was actually said as, a, as an insult. So Leiden, quick on his feet, looks back at the Prince Bishop and responds, Und bist du ein Bischof? And he answers insult for insult. So that you are proved right when you speak And justified when you judge the, sen- the sentencing process and judgment of Leiden and Nipperdaling and, and Kretching, Kretching is the other leader that's captured with, uh, with Leiden and Nipperdaling, it's going to reveal a lot, and it's going to actually allow some application here. Uh, one, it's going to give us a view of how Jan of Leiden viewed Scripture. And it's, I think it's going to be how a lot of evangelicals view Scripture, uh, that may sound uh, offensive, like, wow, you're going to compare evangel- evangelicals to Jan of Leiden? I think you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when I expand this out. <clears throat> um, okay, but here's a, here's a good point, right? When we're abusing Scripture, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have a presuppositional understanding and you bring it with you and then use Scripture to defend that or define that, or if you mishandle Scripture and it leads you down... Uh, down this path as well, this incorrect path. The result is the same. And and don't be mistaken, God can judge you by using his scripture to deceive you. Absolutely can. And you'll be convinced, you'll be convinced that what you're doing is approved by God and actually sanctioned by him. What is interesting is, the, the leader who comes to interrogate Leiden, Nipperdaling, and, uh, and Kretching, which is, this was a normal procedure. They would always interrogate the, the prisoners, try to find out what their, what their uh, motive was. Why did you do this? Why did you think you could do this? What were your presuppositions? How did you base this off scripture, right? Everything was theological. There's no secular understanding for what these men did. And they wanted to know, how they, could, how they could defend what they've done. 
So the leader of these interrogators, which I think is interesting, is actually a Lutheran. <laughs> so I think it, it shows the solidarity of the Lutherans and the Catholics to bring down these rebels and to really figure out what is going through their brains. <clears throat> and during the, during the interrogation, Jan of Leiden's focus on the most. Nipper dolling and Kretching don't really say much. They're kind of mute. I think they just know that they really, maybe they just don't care. They don't have any defense of why they did things or they just did things because Janet Lydon told them to. Um, but the interrogation focuses on Janet Lydon. But Lydon emphasizes uh, that he will answer to God only for what he did and taught. Right? And God will decide if, if he has been wrong. Does that not sound like uh, an answer we would receive today if we're confronting someone on what they're doing? Maybe it'll sound something like this today. Who are you to judge me? We hear that phrase quite a bit. In saying that, there's an assumption in Jan's answer that God has not spoken clearly in his word. To say, to say it's only going to be found out in the judgment means that we cannot know who God is or what his commands are with any real you know, clarity or, or confidence. And scripture does not allow for such ignorance. God's word has condemned him from the beginning as well as, any who, who, as anyone who practices evil, not just Jan of Leiden, but anyone who practices anything against scripture, it's clear that they're going against scripture. Paul holds the Galatians in contempt because of the perspicuity of the gospel. Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 7. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Paul does not say, he does not say, well, actually, you're right, Galatians. You're right. The gospel is hard to understand. Who am I to judge? God will do it later. Paul does not say that. Jan of Leiden emphasizes in his interrogation his agreement with Luther and that justification comes by faith alone and not of works, of which all of us watching will nod our heads. Yeah. What? what how can one who has done such evil speak, speak with such orthodoxy Christians. I think this is, this is important now that we are ready to present an accurate account of such faith. When does Abraham offer Isaac before or after his faith? Well, he does after. Why is that important? Well, James tells us in James chapter two, starting in verse 21, was not Abraham, our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar, you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers, and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Leiden had condemned himself. Leiden is asked why he so clearly violates God's command on marriage. Uh, Leiden's answer is, quote, Why should we be denied... What is permitted to the patriarchs of the Old Testament? Jan responds, uh, we have, what we have always held is this. He who wanted only one wife was never to be forced to have more than one. But we felt that as a man who wanted more than one wife should be free to do so because he was obeying God's command to be fruitful and multiply. And when Jan, Jan's asked, uh, for other verses to support his view on polygamy. And Leiden has the gall to actually quote 1 Timothy chapter 3. A bishop must be the husband of one wife 
and says, this implies that a layman must have more than one. Or, uh, this implies that layman must have more than one because otherwise, why would the bishop be specifically limited? There you have your text. That's, that's all Leiden's quote, end of quote. Unfortunately, Leiden's hermeneutic is all too common in today's evangelical environment. What can we make scripture say when we compartmentalize it? Not allow any context or any congruity. We take a pressure washer and blast off all context in its pages and insert our wills our, and our desires into scripture. We can make scripture say anything. This is the importance of proper hermeneutics. This is the importance of being under uh, proper elders. The interview or the interrogation ends. Uh, about I think they interrogate him for like a day or so. And the three men are sentenced to the harshest judgment that is allowed by the law at this time. And it is going to be very harsh. And again, this is this uh, this part will be a little graphic. So if you have if you have uh, young ones listening, Leiden, Nipperdong, and Kretching, their lead the, their judgment is uh, that they don't, they're going to be led back to Munster and brought before the people who are left in the town. They're going to be brought to to the uh, cathedral square. A platform is built with a single pole stretching uh, from the middle of this platform stretching to the sky. And they're brought to Munster on January uh, uh, 21st. And then on the morning of January 22nd, they're bound to this pole uh, by iron collars. So the iron collar is actually like, if this is the pole, the iron collar is, a, this is weird. But they, here's the pole. The iron collar is just like attached to the pole. There's no give or anything. So it's just attached to the pole. And it's, uh, they put their necks in these collars. And, and the collars have spikes in them. So it doesn't allow them to move around. So it, it limits them from any movement. And it causes excruciating pain. Obviously, it's very uncomfortable. And the sentence is, uh, so they're all tied back to back. So they can't see each other, but they're, they're collared to this, this pole. And each one is to be tortured for one hour straight. And they have to be conscious. So they're tortured for an hour uh, conscious. If they pass out, they revive them. They stop the time, they revive them, and then they continue. And Jan of Leiden went first. The way they did is they used blistering hot tongs. They would pinch the skin and they would use more than one. There'd be like five tongs on, on the, on Jan of Leiden's skin at one point. And uh, after the hour is reached, Jan of Leiden passes out or faints or loses consciousness and a dagger is thrust into his heart when it ends his life. Uh, Nipper Dulling, while he hears Jan of Leiden being tortured, tries to kill himself on the, on the spikes of his collar, uh, but he can't. He's stopped, and he's revived, and the same torture happens to Nipper Dulling and then to Kretching as well. Their bodies are put in three separate cages, and this idea actually comes from Jan of Leiden himself. When he's, he's being interrogated, he makes the joke that the Prince Bishop can earn back all the money he's wasted on this siege by parading all three of them through Germany and charging like a penny from everyone. He would, he would uh, pay back his debts. And uh, some think that that's what gave the Prince Bishop the idea of hanging him in cages. But whatever, whatever spurred the Prince Bishop to do that, uh, the decision was to put the bodies into three separate cages and to have them hoisted above the nave of the St. Lambert's Church over the clock. And it served as a warning to those who would rebel against authority. As of my opinion, too, it, God uses it as, as a warning to those who abuse Scripture. The bones of those three men stayed in those cages for 50 years, 50 years before the, the bones were taken out. But as they brought the cages down to take the bones out, they put them right back up. The cages have lasted through two world wars. 
they've refurbished them, but every time they bring those cages down, they put them right back up. And if you, if you Google, if you go to Google Maps and you look up Munster cages, you will see that those cages are still hanging from St. Lambert's Cathedral today. Of the men that were able to survive the account of Munster and who were Anabaptists, Gresbeck, of course, we talked about him a little bit. Gresbeck goes on to write of his account, his firsthand account of Munster, and he goes on to live in uh, Osnabrück. Um, uh, Osnabrück was where Henry Grays was taken, right? Grays returns to being a school teacher in a town called uh, Borkum, and he, he lives a peaceful life. And it, there is where we end the cautionary tale of Munster. Let's pray. Father, we look on to this history and its warning to us, uh, our, the warning of what happens when we follow our flesh, when we stop mortifying our flesh and decide to, to appease it, it will lead us into death. It will lead others into death. And Father, we pray that you preserve your elect, you preserve your elect in the truth of the of Scripture. You sanctify us by the, your church. You give us desires for your people to take care of our pe- to take care of your church and your people and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, we pray that uh, we are reformed and that we reform in the proper way, as is written in Scripture, how we are brought closer to the image of Christ. That is what we desire, and that is what we pray for. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to